Sunshine. What's up, Discipline Investor? We got Benzinga CEO Jason Raznick here with us. The man, the myth, the legend, Tom Nash. Peter Schiff on the Power Hour with us live today. Interesting, different, unique, innovative companies. Mia, you are live with us on the Power Hour. What's up? Thank you so much for inviting me on. Jessica Billingley is the CEO of Aperna. The best trade idea resource out there. What is up, Zinger Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Benzinga Power Hour, Benzinga's trade idea show. Um, this show is all about trade ideas, and today we are packed. At 12.05, we have Frank Curzio coming on, host of Wall Street Unplugged. Uh, then at 12.15, we have Traeger CEO, which the company is IPOing today under the ticker Cook, C-O-O-K. Uh, Jeremy Andrews will be joining us at 12.15. And then at 12.30, we have Peak Fintech CEO Johnson Joseph joining us, ticker P-K-K-F-F. Uh, real excited about this show. Just real quick before we get to our first guest, I've been looking at AMD all day. When we broke this 100 level, uh, that was a clear sign to me that we were going to see this go a little higher. So I played it a little bit and got uh, about two and a half dollars out of this play right here. Right now, it's kind of stalling out at this level right here. But if we see a nice dip, that might be a time for me to get back into it to try to get a couple more bucks out of the trade. Um, so let me know in the chat what you think about AMD right now at current price levels for the first time above $100. Um, all right, well, without further ado, let's go ahead. Let's get to our first very special guest. This episode is brought to you by Frank Curzio of Wall Street Unplugged. Oh, hey Frank, how we doing? Good, good, how's it going? How's everything, all right? You guys can hear me okay? Everything's great. Can hear you great. Sorry, I put you on while you were grabbing something off screen. Ah, oh, that's perfectly fine. What's going on? Not a whole lot. So give us a rundown of the tickers we talked about last time. I know IBM. Let's see how that's doing. Mm -hmm. See if that's moving with AMD at all. Um, and, and remind me, what, what were the other two we talked about? I think it was Red Rock Resorts that really blew the numbers out of the park. Uh, they reported, uh, I think it was up a little bit yesterday. It might have came down a little bit, like most companies that are beating earnings that have... Yeah, you know, the risk reward owning companies and the earnings has not been great, right? I mean, companies that, that really beat and blow out the numbers, uh, you're seeing come down a little bit. And the ones that don't, like the UPSs, Netgear, uh, was Boston Beer. Wow, Sam's. I mean, you, you look at the charts on some of those have gotten destroyed. So, uh, but Red Rock Resorts just put up uh, outstanding, outstanding numbers. And that's going to continue. That's going to continue. They have pricing power. The companies that have pricing power are going to continue to do well. So, Red Rock Resorts was another one. Yeah, we also looked idea. at Expedia. Mm hmm. Check in on that. Another travel play. I like that. Um, so mm -hmm. have you been watching AMD's price mm -hmm. action today? I love AMD. Actually, that's one of the, the stocks I was going to say as a trading opportunity. It's a company I followed for a while. I know they reported blowout earnings showing 100% growth on revenue, right? So uh, two quarters in a row, which is uh, unbelievable. But these guys are in everything. I mean, they're in the high growth markets in the semiconductor industry. And if you want to look at AMD, it, it's Basically, you have to look at Intel. And every time Intel, and I won't curse and say F's up, F's up, but you're looking at AMD as the beneficiary. And gaming is set to take off in the back half of the year. They're expecting those numbers to get every, even better. But even from a technical level, this is a stock I own personally for a while that if you look since November, right, it tested the 90, 92, 94. Like it couldn't break 100. And it tested like three, four times in the past four months. Now that it broke through and it broke through on really, really strong results, I think we see... Yeah, the hundred dollars is the bottom here. I think that's going to hold. And as a trading opportunity, I see it going to one fifteen, one twenty uh, in the in the short term. You're going to see a lot of new money come into this name now that they finally broke through that that hundred dollar level, which took them a while to do. Yeah, I mean, when I saw that break through a hundred today, that was a clear sign to me. That was kind of like get in this now for a little run up, and then we could see some dips. Um, but I don't see it coming back below that hundred dollar level in the short term. So I agree with you there. Definitely a good trade opportunity there. Yeah, no, definitely a good trading opportunity. And look, it's it's not just gaming that everybody talks about. Also, they're taking market share in data centers from Intel, which was a surprise. That's a big deal. That's like just, you know, picking up the scraps and, and doing fantastic across across the board. But uh, Matt, great management team. And uh, yeah, now that that finally broke through, I think you're going to see this name get a lot of attention, which hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the past three, four months compared to, you know, the FANG names that have been pushing higher and pushing higher and pushing higher into earnings. This company has kind of been just, uh, you know, leveling out, but now it's on everybody's radar and I think you're going to see a lot more money come into it. 
Yeah, and in, NVIDIA too has been getting a lot of attention, which AMD and NVIDIA often trade together, but we've seen NVIDIA kind of outperform yeah. AMD recently. So now maybe this is AMD's mm -hmm. turn to catch up with NVIDIA. Exactly, exactly. Um, all right, so anything else on your watch list right now? Okay, so uh, another name I like is, is a large cap. Uh, so, you know, the trading opportunity is AMD. I like to provide, you know, even a speculative name I'll, I'll provide next. But when I say this is a conservative name, it is a conservative name, but it's a stock that I think that that could double uh, within 24 months, and that's Boeing. Uh, I know my a lot of people, Dow Component, you know, it's crazy. But the quarter they reported that they showed a profit when they're just seeing 70% of domestic come back. These guys are basically the only game in town outside of Airbus, right? So they're not going out of business anytime soon. I know they have a lot of debt in their balance sheet. But I visited the Everett Washington facility. It's, you got to see it. It's one of the greatest facilities. Ever, one of the biggest facilities in the world, right? It's an assembly line for airplanes, basically. I have their own runways and everything. It's incredible. But when you're looking at Boeing and the quarter that they announced shows that they are making progress. If you look at that stock before they had the max problems, before COVID, it was over 400. You're going to see massive, massive, massive amount of orders come back. In fact, it was over 5,500 orders for their max plane. That max plane is unbelievable. And unbelievable in terms of the customers buying it. It's it's lighter weight. It saves 20, 30% on fuel costs. Again, massive, massive orders before all this stuff happened. You're looking at uh, now it, it's a go in the US, the max plane. You're looking at, at getting certified from China and also the UK over the next three months. And over the next three to six months, you're really going to see international travel open up, I believe, finally. But you're going to see earnings, profits explode because the airline industry, if you just listen to them, Delta, uh, American Airlines, I mean, it, there's an explosion domestically. They have incredible pricing power. Anyone that flies knows how much it costs to fly. It's a lot more. Uh, you're seeing all the planes full now. And the, almost every one of these guys, outside of Delta, who updated their fleet and still need more updating, they all have to, to, to update their fleet. And when they do, they're going to come to Boeing and Airbus, the only two, two games in town. And... Uh, yeah, I think you're going to see this this company explode. I just couldn't believe though they they reported a profit, uh, considering you know you just you have domestic seventy percent. Uh, wait till that goes to one hundred percent. When it goes to one hundred percent, you're going to see even they have pricing power. It's just it's an incredible market that's going to be booming, uh, and all almost every single airline has to update their fleet. Yeah, I mean, to me, looking at this price level where it was at uh, right before the COVID crash, around 340, and currently it's only at 234, mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen this kind of sustained uptrend since the COVID crash. It was all the way down below $100, and mm -hmm. we just see it kind of inching back up. I do expect it to get back up to its pre-COVID levels uh, within the next year or so, so definitely like that and opportunity. Even if you keep the well. chart, if you keep that chart right there and you see, you know, COVID, you know, you had a couple of highs have come off, but it's a nice steady trend higher, right? So... Now, if you look at the last month, you're, you're clearly seeing that trend. And I love when you see like that breakthrough on positive numbers. It's not just, hey, we broke through for no reason on technicals. Yeah, you know, When you break through on positive news like AMD has, when you break through those levels that you couldn't really break through, uh, and it's on positive news, positive earnings, uh, good outlook going forward, usually you see these stocks run incredibly higher. And these guys, as you can see, have a lot of room to grow. 5,500 planes they had on order before all this crap hit the fan. Those orders have to come back, and they have to either go to – Airbus, which doesn't have a competitor to the max, they do, but it's not as efficient. I've done the research on this, and uh, you know, it is they're going to get tons of orders for that max because it's going to save these companies so much money, and all of them are looking to save on fueling costs because this is a much lighter plane, much better plane than anything out there. A lot of these airlines. Let's go. Let's check in on the the Jets ETF real quick. I wonder if this that's run by my buddy Frank Holmes, a great great guy, U.S. Global, uh, and that's that's the, that's the largest. Uh, ETF dedicated to, to the airline industry. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's a safer play. I, I think you're if you need a safer play, buy Jets. Great, great company. Uh, great ETF. Uh, you got to own all the majors. For me, I really like Delta. I think the, you know, they have the best fleet right now, uh, have incredible pricing power. And that stock is still, what, 20, 25% below its pre-COVID highs. And when we look at a lot of companies in the reopen trade, even the cruise ships, I mean, these are companies that surpass that. And what do they have? 35% of ships, 35% in operation. And they're already on, on, on a market cap basis, you know, on an enterprise level, which assumes debt and all the debt they took out. They're trading at higher levels, which is crazy. Operating at 35%. Now you're looking at a lot opening up uh, overseas. And the domestic market is really killing it right now. You know, for Delta and American Airlines, those are two names I, I like a lot. 
Uh, Southwest is more of a conservative play, but uh, they're still well, well off their pre-COVID highs. And I think you're going to see them pop through their highs probably within the next six to 12 months. But I would say next six months. Yeah, it's interesting because in that sector, in the airline sector, a couple of the, the companies have gotten back to their pre-COVID levels, but most haven't. And you can see that here in the Jets chart that it's it's been creeping up just like Boeing has, but it mm -hmm. still has a little bit of ways to go back to that $32 level that it was at uh, before COVID. Um, so we've got the airlines covered. We also looked at Expedia last week. So the mm -hmm. travel that that play is on right now for you, Frank, anything else you're looking at? There's one of the stock that's super aggressive. Uh, and I'm looking at Nicola. <laughs> so okay. I can imagine the boys probably lighting up. But so I know everything about Nicola, right? I understand Trevor Milton, uh, you know, fabricated a lot, a lot of the numbers. I get that, you know, they have the SEC investigation. We've seen the stock go from 50 to 13 because of that. Uh, and you're looking at still a $4.75 billion valuation might seem pretty high. I will tell you this though, Nicola right now is going to be the first company to come out with an EV semi. And it has the best technology right now out of all the companies. If they're able to come out, which is before year end, I think this company presents a tremendous opportunity. They got a new management team. They do have to raise money. Again, all this is on the table. All this is on the table. We know this. I wouldn't put money in the stock that you can't afford to lose. The reason why I like it so much, because if you look at one of their competitors, which is Rivian, who's still a private company and got 100,000 ordered for, for EV vans for, for Amazon, which I don't think they delivered yet. Uh, they're going to IPO, I believe, later this year at a fifty to seventy billion dollar valuation. If Nikola could wow. be the Tesla here, where if you look at EVs, everybody, Ford's talking up their EV portfolio, GM's talking up their EV portfolio. None of them have EVs on the market, right? You never see them. You never see any EVs other than Teslas, right? You see, when you're driving, you see Teslas on the road. That's why it has a six hundred billion dollar plus market cap. First in the market, COVID did it was a great thing. You're seeing supply chain issues. People are just having trouble getting these to the market. They have 10 trucks right now that they're just going through the final tests. And if they get this right, if they report next quarter that it's going to be a delay, you're probably going to see this stock sell off tremendously because everyone that's in the stock is probably going to be done because you know they're sick of everything. But this is an off-the-radar name. Nobody believes in it, but they do have the technology. Trevor Milton just didn't handle this right. Again, just was super optimistic and almost lied about some of the numbers, which he didn't have to do. But when you look at the technology for semi-trucks, for, for, uh, semi and it's not EVs where just, you know, EV autos where, you know, you and I could buy and maybe 10, 15% of the total market is EVs in like 10 years, who knows? Truck companies, their fleets, they're going to be mandated. If you're looking at every single company now that reports and they have their presentation at the quarter, they all have an ESG section, right? Every single one of them. So they, they're pushing into this where, you know, free carbon emissions, 2030, they have a whole coalition. These are companies like the Walmarts, the Targets, everybody that owns a fleet, even Amazon, they have their own fleets. They're going to push into this truck market and they have tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to spend, uh, which is on their balance sheets. So they're going to be forced into this. It's a lot of money that's coming in and whoever's first to the market, I think, you, I mean, Rivian to come out of a 50 to $70 billion IPO, if Nikola can come out first with that semi-truck, that EV, which they said they are, which is going to be earlier, this is something that I see where put a couple thousand dollars in it. If you lose it, you lose it. You don't care. You can even put a stop on it. But if I'm right, this is a 5X to 10X winner. And again, this is off everyone's radar. I know every single risk of this company, so you don't have to tell me. I went through it. That's why it's trading at 13 and not 50. But uh, the technology is there. The management team, new management team is there. And uh, I think that this stock, uh, again, people hated Tesla at a few billion dollar valuation, and, and they got it done. This kind of reminds me of them if they could really get this technology and get this truck to market first. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I know in Tesla's earning call, uh, Tesla said that there was going to be a delay in their semi-production. So definitely got to keep an eye on this one. Uh, Hylion's also being thrown out in the chat as a potential competitor. Mm -hmm. um, but all right, Frank, we've got some good stock picks today between uh, <laughs> Nikola. We checked out Boeing. We went back to Expedia. So thank you again for coming on the show. We do got to hop. We got our next guest here. Uh, but looking forward to to next Thursday when we get you back on. All right, guys. Be sure to look at our podcast too at WSUPodcast.com, uh, which we tape every week on Wednesday for free. So a really great guest coming up too. So good stuff. Yep, Thanks, I'm, throw, I'm throwing the link to the podcast in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Go check that out. And thank you again, Frank. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. Yes, sir. All right, y'all. That was Frank Curzio, host of Wall Street Unplug. I'm putting the link in the chat. If you guys want to go check out his podcast, super impressive. He has not missed a show in over 10 years. Um, incredible. All right. Bef without further ado, I'm going to bring my buddy Spencer on the stream.
Yo, yo, yo. What up, baby? Spence, how we doing? Good, good. It's a busy day, man. It is a busy, busy day. Uh, we've all been talking uh, this morning about this uh, Robin Hood IPO, but that is not the only IPO of the day, if you can believe it. Uh, our next guest is, uh, is is just went through that process himself, and Traeger Grills IPO today under uh, perhaps, dare I say, the best, if not one of the best, we'll, we'll say like in the top 2% best uh, symbols on the street, ticker Cook, fantastic symbol. Let's bring on Jeremy Andrews right now, the CEO of Traeger Grills. Shall we do that, AB? Let's do it. Jeremy. Good morning. Hey, Thanks good morning. Uh, good afternoon. How are you? Good. Yeah, it's, it's already past noon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry. I lost, lost track of time. Jeremy Andrews, welcome to the Power Hour. Um, man, um, I just let, let's just start with this. Uh, I, I was surprised to see that uh, there was uh, more money spent, a 5% increase uh, uh, in money spent on grills this year than last year. I, th- I would have thought last year would have been, you know, peak grill season right everyone's stuck at home so like what is uh, give us a sense of what the grill market is like right now yeah 100 percent. so uh I, I guess first of all i would say there's been a trend towards um better culinary experiences that started long before the pandemic and so uh home cooking uh, that, that that trend had started we've been growing nicely for many years coming to the pandemic i think uh, home cooking, outdoor cooking in particular, was it's a lifesaver to people during the pandemic. They couldn't go to restaurants. Um, you know, they needed to, they, they, they learned to cook at home and it became a really important hobby. And, and we actually, you know, as you think about some of the consumer behaviors that change, that will be sticky, home fitness, outdoor recreation, home cooking is one of them. And so, in fact, as we surveyed our consumers, we found that 70% of our consumers, I'm sorry, 70% of Americans said they would cook as much, if not not more, post the pandemic. 35% of Americans said they found a hobby in cooking. And so, you know, YouTube content, for example, around home cooking doubled during the, during the pandemic. So there is... Um, this is not a behavior that we think is changing, and, and we're feeling that in our business right now. So, you, so AB, go ahead. Uh, I, I just got to ask real quick, Mr. Andres, a Traeger, is it a grill? Is it a smoker? <laughs> clear that up for me real quick, because I've, I've heard both. You, you know what? Boy, this is a hard one to clear up. Here's what I'll tell you. Uh, some people call it, call it a smoker. We call it a grill, but even that's not, even that's not, the, not, not the perfect word. A, a Traeger does so much. It's effectively an outdoor convection oven that uses wood as, as its fuel source, but all, also as a, the source of flavoring food. So, you know, you can, you can do everything a grill can do. You can cook, you know, hot and fast steak, salmon, hamburgers, pork tenderloin, what, whatever it may be. You can do low and slow barbecue. I mean, like when, when you learn that you can do a world-class brisket at your home in your Traeger, yeah, beef ribs, pork ribs, but you can also bake. Like we love to bake pizzas and we bake, you know, uh, desserts in cast iron skillets. So you can do so much with it. The only way to describe what a Traeger is, is it's a Traeger. You Traeger. It is like, it's it's unlike any other solution on the market. And, and candidly, that's really what's driving this passion and energy behind our community, behind the Traeger hood. It's like people love it. They 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 get hooked, and they become our best evangelist. I think you're making our chat a little a little hungry here. <laughs> Let's go. Wait, I I, I want to ask. I'm I'm so interested in in these sudden barbecue wars because you guys had your IPO today. Weber just filed for their own IPO. Uh, why why IPO? Why now? You know what? Um, look, we uh, Tra- Traeger's Traeger's growing. Uh, we're we're a disruptor. Um, you know, between 2015 and 2019, even pre-pandemic, we grew at a 30% top line Kager. So we are taking share, we're growing. And I would say a couple of reasons uh, why now. Number one, you know, we are investing in our business. We're investing in, in product innovation. We're investing behind the brand. So we're able, we were able to raise some primary capital. 
uh, to put on the balance sheet. But um, it was also an opportunity for our community who loves us so much to be owners and in and, and the exposure and the connectivity to those who are members of our community is so important to us. And so I got to tell you, like the, the, the response has been overwhelming to be able to participate in this. And, uh, you know, for us, I, I can't answer the, the, the why, the, the why now for other, other brands like Weber, but I can tell you that we were the only brand really growing and taking share pre pandemic. And we were the brand taking share when everyone grew during the pandemic. Got it. And then real quick, Jeremy, what, what's the benefit for someone at home cooking with wood as opposed to say like charcoal on, on a typical grill? Well, look, first of all, uh, when you cook with wood, your food tastes better. And that's a fact. Uh, the reality is, is that cooking with wood is always, has been hard. I mean, it's uh, pre-Traeger. You, you, you've got you to get the wood. You've got you've to stoke a fire. You've got to add fuel and, and, and manage temperature. And so those who get really good at it, who like really master the art and they're willing to put the time into it, they produce these amazing meals. But that's not for most people. And so what Traeger does is takes uh, all of the benefits of cooking with wood in a convection format, just the amazing flavor and the versatility, but then it makes it accessible to someone like me. And, and we've integrated a lot of other technology that, that, that really brings someone on this cooking journey from, I mean, I was a novice before I bought my first Traeger. And I bought, I bought my first Traeger before I had anything to do with the brand Traeger. And I started cooking and my wife, who's an amazing cook and knows that I was a lousy cook. Uh, she was impressed. Like I started cooking things that were, were more than edible. And so I'm a great cook now on the trigger. I love to cook. And, and this is really, this is really where the passion comes from. When someone finds this hobby and they sit around a table and like, Get, and, and they serve this amazing meal. It's like, high five, dad. This was amazing. Well done. What do you do? You have this great, this very communal bonding moment, and you want to cook more. And that's what happens with uh, with the Traeger owner. In, in our, digital, our, our, our digital connectivity, our digital product, we've curated and created 1,600 recipes for Traeger, and we teach you to cook uh, one recipe at a time. Uh, Jeremy, question here from our chat from Solar Up. Does Traeger have any plans for an offset style smoker? I really want an offset wood smoker, but an offset Traeger would be an ideal alternative. You know what? Uh, we we are always innovating. Um, you know, I say constantly, we have not yet built our defining product, but it's not going to be an offset smoker. And and there's a reason for that. An offset smoker, like for, for, for like the stick burner guy that the person that likes to play with fire you know that's willing to take all day on a saturday or a sunday it's a, it's a great product but but that that that's a small it's a small audience traeger is uh it, it is beloved and appreciated by enthusiasts of barbecue uh by 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 chefs we've got michelin chefs cooking on it but it makes cooking with wood accessible to everyone and so Offset smoker, great product, but it, but it's a small addressable consumer base. Okay. Got it. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Andrews. Well, thank you for joining us. Wait, on the I, power. I, I have one more question for Jeremy. Uh, oh, I, all right. Well, we, we did just get a note that that he has to wrap, but go okay, ahead. okay. One more. Uh, this is not your first go around as far as public company IP, uh, IPO. You were you were with Skull Candy. Did you learn anything from that go around? How much time do you have? <laughs> I, 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 honest, yeah, honestly, here's here's what I'll say. Yeah, business isn't rocket science but the value of pattern recognition so that you can make better decisions faster is so important. And, and the reality is that, you know, 10 years ago when I did this, I was a, I, I was a young CEO yeah. and look, stub my toe and learn, but, it, but I will tell you Traeger is an incredible platform. I am 10 years and one week older, but I'm 20 years wiser. All right. Jeremy Andrews is the CEO of Traeger Grills, ticker cook. Jeremy, congratulations. Looking forward to uh, Thank you. to more stuff down the line. All right. Got a note here, AB. Uh, while we were on the on the line with Jeremy just now, 
Hood. In a- Thank you. <laughs> Hood open for training. Opened at the IPO price. $38 per share. Did price at the low end of the range last night. The range was... Uh, Anywhere from 38 to 42. They did price it last night at 38. There were some indications this morning it could go anywhere from 38 to 40 to 40 and change. So we did open at the IPO price. Again, um, a lot of unknowns here. One in the chat, if you got an allocation on Robinhood uh, of the IPO, I did not. Uh, I have an account, but no money in it. Aaron Bree, I don't know what your situation with Robinhood is, if you have an account there or not. Um, but I one, do. Do, do, do you have an allocation? Did you get shares? Uh, wait. You like automatically get shares of Robinhood if you. No, you had to ask. All right, you don't know anything. <laughs> you had to ask. Yeah, you had to apply. Uh, I did not do that, but I, I mean, I, I'm staying on the sideline of this one, Spencer. We've talked about it before that studies have shown that within six months, uh, an IPO stock will be trading below its initial offering. So, I mean, I, I might look to get into this one around the twenty dollar level. But not now, and that's why I didn't apply to get the early shares. Okay, one person in chat has been like, "Yep, me, me I got some shares," and so they're done any- already. So anyway, uh, so much to uh, to to digest here with with this IPO. Uh, I do want to get our next guest on in, in a second, but just uh, look, okay. So we are or we're already below the IPO price. Okay, so your your bogey is going to be thirty eight. That's a very big number psychologically. Everybody who got the IPO. Uh, last night or this morning, they got it at thirty-eight dollars. They are locked up for a month. I learned that this morning. Um, so, watching this throughout the day, uh, and someone tell someone let me know. Somebody hop on the Robinhood account and let, let me know if you can short Robinhood shares right now. I don't think it's it, it's not that easy. Uh, to you can't just run up and short an IPO like that. So, um, let me know if uh, if you fit if you physically can do it. I know a lot of you want to do no, it. So on my, oh, here we go. It's only giving me an option to buy, yeah, not, not yeah. trade. So the only and, thing I can do on Robinhood on the hood ticker yeah. is buy. You can't just rock up to an IPO on its opening day and just short it. That's not how it works. So uh, anyway, we are open finally. It took half the day, but we got there. Um, <laughs> all right. This is going to be an exciting one. Let's watch. There's no news on Robinhood's like, main news page about the IPO. Interesting. Is that a sell signal? I don't know. What that I, means. I think so. All right. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Let's bring on our next guest here. We have Johnson Joseph in the waiting room. He's the CEO of Peak FinTech Group. We've had several people ask us about this one in the last couple of days. Ticker PKKFF. Let's get him on here now. <laughs> Johnson Joseph, welcome to the Power Hour. Oh, can you hear us? Johnson. Hey. All right, we got you. Yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear you guys. Okay, that's okay. Uh, you, you hear us now. Good afternoon. How are we doing today? Fantastic. How are you? Good. All right. Tell us about um, this company. I, I, I'm really not quite sure why we've gotten so many questions about you all in the past week, but we have. Just tell us about the business and then we'll go from there. Okay, sure. Um, Peak FinTech Group, what we do is um, we run a platform uh, in China primarily right now where we um, bring together small businesses, small micro businesses who are looking for funding primarily with uh, lending, op- with uh, financial institutions willing to lend to them. So um, the way the concept works is very simple. So uh, if you're a small business owner, uh, whether it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you give us access to your data. Uh, we basically read information from the business's uh, accounting software system. We pull uh, tax bureau data on them. Uh, we have information that allows us to, uh, to read their bank statements. And we take all of this information and we help qualify them for loans for credit, whether they need to finance uh, receivables, they need to replenish their inventory, they want to get paid sooner, uh, whatever the case may be. So essentially what we do is we, uh, we are a marketplace for commercial loans between small, me- medium-sized businesses and lending financial institutions. Now, what's interesting about the company is that we launched uh, in China in uh, 2018. We generated about 1.6, these are all Canadian dollars, by the way, we're based in Canada. We're um, headquartered in Montreal, even though all of our operations are in China right now. Uh, so we generated uh, $1.6 million in revenue in 2018. 
That was the first year. The second year, we uh, we scaled that up to 11.7 million. That was 2019. 2020, we just uh, um, filed, well, a few months ago, we filed our fourth quarter results. We generated $42 million in revenue. And for 2021, we're forecasting over 100 million. 2022, it should scale up to 300 million. And uh, 2023, we're looking at the 600 million. So the company is going very, very fast. And uh, we have uh, intentions on coming to North America before the end of this year. Okay. So, Jonathan, I mean, your, your operations in China, I, I, I got to ask, you know, the elephant in the room here. Like, are, are you concerned at all about the, the uh, I don't know what, how you want to phrase it, the, the control that the Chinese government seems to be asserting uh, over its capital markets right now and over many of its businesses that, that trade publicly here in the U.S.? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We get that all the time, especially lately. Um, first thing to um, um, to point out is that we are not a Chinese company, right? So um, we are not a Chinese company. So the uh, our main regulator is not the Chinese securities regulator, right? So we are based in Canada. The main regulator for our company is the Quebec regulator. That's the province that we're based in. So that's the number one thing. The second thing is uh, what's happening in China right now is uh, there, there, there are a couple of things. So uh, the Chinese government is looking to protect the personal and private information of its citizens. So a lot of the companies that have had issues, let's call it lately, are companies that deal with private individuals. They collect personal private information and the government is concerned about that. We are strictly a B2B platform. We do not deal with consumers at all. We do not collect personal information on our clients. We essentially, we're, we're essentially interested in how is the business doing? So we facilitate uh, transactions between lending financial institutions and small businesses, that's it. So uh, the government is fully aware, by the way, of our operations in China. In fact, one of the biggest um, partnerships that we recently signed was with a subsidiary of uh, China Union Pay called Rongbang Technologies. And China Union Pay is a state-owned entity. They control the flow of funds throughout China. They are the largest um, card payment processing company in all of the world, larger than Visa and MasterCard. And uh, we basically, just this morning, we announced that uh, we had taken a small participation in the uh, the private company, Wrong Bank Technologies. So in a way right now, we are kind of like partners with uh, with China Union Pay, which is a state-owned entity. So that just gives you an idea um, that the government in, 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 in China is not after us. They're not looking to disturb our operations, quite the contrary. But if the government can say, hey, we all of a sudden are deciding that we're concerned about the, the data being gathered about uh, our, our our citizens couldn't they also just as easily say we are now concerned about the data being gathered about our businesses Is this again they, again they're fully aware of what we're doing our servers are in china they, they um we understand that the information in china the data that we're collecting does not leave china right so it remains in our servers there it's uh, protected by encryption uh the government has looked into our systems um on several occasions and again what we're doing is we are facilitating business for small and micro businesses. They are the backbone of the Chinese economy. They're responsible for 70 or 75% of the jobs throughout the country. And uh, ever since we started operating in there, uh, um, ever since we started operating our platform, the government has noticed in the cities where we operate, they've noticed uh, um, an improvement in the operations of small businesses. So again, we have partnerships with the city of Jiangying. Uh, we work with them very closely with them. So we're contributing to the um, the development of the economy in China. So there is no incentive for the government um, to to prevent us from helping their small businesses in China. And then, uh, Mr. Joseph, real quick, I have a very special guest to bring on with us. Um, this is one of the biggest fans of the company. He actually pitched this stock on this very show. Uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago at this point. Uh, but without further ado, let me bring on Young Investor. Young Investor! What's going on, Young Investor? How we doing? All right. All hey, right. I'm a fan. Nice to meet you, Young Investor. You've watched my channel? I'm sorry? Wait, have you watched my channel before? No, no, I've seen I've seen somebody sent me links to, uh, yeah, the, the uh, to coverages video. that you've done before. And yeah, listen, it's an honor. No, it's an honor uh, to speak to you. So can you first, firstly tell us today about today's press release? Because today you announced that you're investing in Rongbang, which is a subsidiary of UnionPay, 
for less than 1% of the company, but for $500,000 Canadian. You said this is a, it isn't, should, shouldn't be um, viewed as kind of a normal investment. So tell us about the strategic opportunities of this, how it strengthens your you know, ties with union pay and you know, your trials of this going forward. Oh, absolutely. Listen, uh, this was, for, first of all, um, investing in union pay, not everybody uh, can decide, okay, you know what, I'm going to invest in wrong bank. First of all, it was an invitation. So that was a huge honor, right? So for union pay to recognize the impact that we we're having uh, with just about a month's worth of operations using their network is a tremendous honor. So they invited us to, uh, to make this investment, but the investment is more symbolic than anything else, right? So to be associated with union pay, again, this is the largest card payment uh, uh, company in all of the world. And for them to recognize what we're doing, how we're helping businesses, uh, and to invite us to make this investment, obviously, it's going to open doors for us. It brings a lot of credibility to the company. Now, when we go see clients, partners, hey, you know what? We're, we're somehow associated with union pay. It is huge for us. The second thing is uh, it gives us a seat at the table, right? So union, you have union pay, but you have other large uh, state-owned companies that are investors in wrong bank technology. So that gives us a seat at the table. So we're not aware of interesting projects that could be happening, whether it's in the clean tech uh, uh, sector or any other sector. So it was a tremendous, tremendous investment for us. Yeah. So another thing uh, worth noting, which I'd like to ask you about is you recently, you know, this really, you know, when I saw this on there, you know, it really made me pumped. So tell us about the guidance you recently issued. So I'm super excited about this guidance. So for this year, you're projecting 104 million. Obviously, you can't comment on whether it's, you know, uh, you expect more than that. But, you know, historically, Peaks guidance has been you know, pretty conservative you know, for the last few years. So tell us about the guidance recently. So you're projecting 104 million revenue in 2021. I want to know more about your long term outlook for the company in 2023. And by the way, this is all Canadian for anyone watching. Because in 2023, you said you expect 624 million Canadian with 102 million net profit and uh, net income. So, you know, tell us about how you get there. And, you know, you're getting the kind of point where uh, Upstart projected have very similar net income for you in that year, but you're um, below Upstart, so in terms of their revenue in that year. So tell us more about how you aim to reach that, you know, your future going forward, as long as, um, is that also included with foreign expansion in that, in that guidance you um, created? That, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, first and foremost, um, the, uh, the guidance that we put out was strictly for China. And as I mentioned earlier, we have intentions of coming to North America. So that the numbers for North America and other parts of the world also, eventually UK, uh, South America, that is not included in there. So that's strictly China, number one. The second thing is uh, because of what we have seen from our operations so far in China, most of our business is coming from repeat business. So you have these large uh, distributors. I, I don't know if you're familiar, young investor with uh, um, Kafka. Kafka is uh, China Oil and Foodstuffs Corporation. They are the largest, if I'm not mistaken, the largest food processing uh, company in all of Asia. And uh, a lot of our clients deal with them. So just think about this for a second, right? So all of the uh, um, goods, food stuff that is consumed in China, whether it's rice, uh, packaged goods or whatever, noodles, all that stuff, most of it is produced by Kafka, right? So we have a lot of clients who buy regularly from Kafka. So they they have cash flow issues that we're helping them with. So so a lot of our business comes from there. So there are a lot of companies also that deal with JD.com, Alibaba, these large e-commerce portals. They buy and sell products all the time from large manufacturers. So we talk to these clients and we get their for the, these are companies that, you know, they have a history, right? So we're not coming out. Okay. Well, it's a new company, whatever we're pulling numbers out of the air. No, we talk to our clients. We know what they expect for the next year, two, three years. And then our forecasts are based on those numbers primarily. Okay. So I kind of have um, one, one last kind of major question. I would like to know from you. So I was recently speaking on my channel to uh, Sheldon in Wintash, mm -hmm. you know very well. So we spoke about Peak for a good section section of our interview. And one of the things we kept talking about was foreign expansion for Peak. So you already know you're going to expanding to North America, hopefully by the end of this year. Correct. Now, now Peak's are very kind of, in one sense, simple to replicate across the globe. It's not something you need to figure out a brand new kind of, uh, you know, plan brand new everything as soon as you go to a new country. You only need to get regulatory approval and connections with the banks in that country. 
to be able to facilitate lending on your app. So here's about foreign expansion for you, and do you really see this as being something you're planning to expand eventually across the world into Canada, North America, eventually Europe? You know, could this really be you know, a global business, which in a few years, maybe like five, ten years down the road, it's a really more, it's a global business, you know, pulling in revenues from all different parts of the world in Europe and North America and China, you know, and Asia. Absolutely, young investor. That that's that's a great question, also. And yes, that is uh, part of our plan. So what we're doing is we're building right right now. It started in China, but it's an ecosystem, right? So it's a business ecosystem. We started off as a lending hub, facil 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 facilitating lending transactions between financial institutions and small businesses. But we're also talking to these small businesses, right? So they need other things. They need logistics. They need this. They need that. And they'd like to be connected, right? Like they're, they're looking for partners. They're looking for uh, suppliers. They're looking for this. So networking in the future is going to be a very, very important aspect of our ecosystem. So right now we're already setting up these businesses to network amongst themselves in China. But believe it or not, um, there is a small, well, we have a small network already being built in Canada. And the Canadian business is already asking about, well, can we, get in touch with some of the business in China. You know, we'd like to find a, a, a supplier. We'd like to export or some of our goods, that kind of stuff. So yes, our plan in the future is to create this global ecosystem of businesses where businesses are going to be able to get funding and they're going to be able to get market research report. They're going to be able to network amongst each other. Yeah. Got it. I got, oh, sorry, young investor. I got to hop in yeah. here real quick. We got, you, we can ask one more question, but I'm just curious young investor, how did you find this company initially and like what stuck out to you about it? Yeah, so originally I found this uh, company for, you know, one of the many Discord servers and after that, you know, one of the bigger Discord servers which is, you know, affiliated, you know, well not affiliated, but you know, our investors in peak, you know, shout out to the guys at Stockfam, I know a lot of them are in the chat, you know, JJ did that, I got to say an awesome interview with them recently, there's so many little little gems in there, it was like kind of Sean's predicting his next move. Yes, yeah, so I found this, you know, through mainly just people reckon, recommending it to me. And I get a fair few stocks. You know, this one's really stood out to me because they started talking about, you know, the amount of revenue growth it was receiving, the net profits it could be having in the future, you know, 56%, you know, operating margins, you know, from what JJ has said previously in other interviews before the air quiet period um, happened, or, you know, couldn't really do any interviews or talk about the stock that much. But yeah. You know, ever since I've really heard about the stock, I've just been constantly doing due diligence, you know, constantly adding to my position. I absolutely love what JJ and the team over at Peak are doing. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you for, for hopping on to ask a few questions. And yeah, the due diligence is so impressive at, at a very young age to know so much about the company. So we appreciate your your wisdom on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing me on. Yeah, and hopefully one day I can interview, interview in a few weeks, JJ. Absolutely. I'd be honored. Very nice meeting you, young investor. Very nice meeting you too. Yeah. We, oh, <laughs> sorry about that, young investor. We'll get you back on. Um, but yeah, thank you, Mr. Joseph, for joining the show today. Uh, let me know if there's anything else you want to leave our investors with before uh, heading out this afternoon. No, listen, I just want to say I appreciate the opportunity um, to connect with a new audience here. Um, we're expecting to have a lot of fun. Should be on NASDAQ before the end of, uh, for the U.S. audience out there. Should be on NASDAQ before the end of August. So um, keep an eye out for that. Thanks again. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy Thursday for joining us. And yeah, I mean, I'm excited about that, seeing the uplist to NASDAQ. So we'll definitely keep an eye on this, keep it on the watch list. And we'd love to get you back on the show if when we get more news, uh, anytime you have anything to share. Absolutely, anytime. Thank you. Awesome. No problem. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. All right, y'all. That was Peak FinTech Group, ticker PKK or PKKFF. Um, we got Traeger's chart back up Dude, here. That, that was a blast. That was so much fun. I did not expect that. You didn't expect Young Investor to hop on? I always got tricks no. up my sleeve, Spencer. I did not expect Young Investor to hop on. That was I, great. Always got, I always got tricks up my sleeve. Uh, meanwhile, um, Let's somebody, check it on hood. Somebody call the, the sheriff of, of Nottingham or Maid Marion or Little John or, or call somebody. Because Robin Hood's in trouble, okay? Call Friar Tuck. Robin Hood is in trouble. Are those, are those characters from Robin Hood? Yeah. yeah. Did you not, did you, I, I'm glad you picked up on the context there. Yeah. Uh, I, context clues for the win. Um, yeah, Robin Hood is down, <laughs> trading down like 10% here uh, from its, uh, more than, maybe a little around there now, um, from its IPO price. Again, $38 a share is where IP, uh, Robin Hood opened at the, today. Um 
how low can it go? Is I guess it's made a temporary low for now. Uh, I think everyone wants to short it just for fun. Um, I don't know if 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 um, buying or selling for fun is necessarily a good strategy, but it, it, that seems to be the prevailing um, feeling out there, at least in our chat. Um, so is is this a big payday for Vlad, or are his shares locked up? Hold on, hold on. I just want to address Chris's comment. Yeah, I've been holding on to those references for like. 15 years, Chris. I just, I, I'll have you know. Perhaps. Full disclosure, this might be a dumb question. Is Robin Hood and Peter Pan, is there any relation there? No. 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 Okay. No. Peter. No. Robin Hood is in. Steals like, from the rich and gives to the poor. Uh, but Robin Hood is in a whole different like century, bro. Got it. <laughs> okay. Just so we're clear. I think Peter Pan might have been based on Robin Hood initially. Uh, perhaps. Um, What was the question? I'm sorry. Before that. Um. Is today a big payday? Oh, yeah. For Vlad, I, I'll tell you who's today's a big payday for. In addition to Vlad, uh, is Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg was an early investor in Robinhood. I think he got shares for like for like a like the dime or something, ten cents. Really? Um, yeah. Today's a big payday for all those guys. Well, but, but their shares are locked up, right? Or no? Um, probably. I'm sure there's some lockups. Sure, yeah. But think of like what is an IPO at its very core? It is a liquidity event, right? In the private market, it is. It's not. It's not impossible, but it is difficult uh, to to sell your stake in a private company. You can do it. It's just it's hard. Um, it's much easier, obviously, when your company is publicly traded. Uh, so yeah, there are some. I'm sure that I'm sure they're locked up. I they they have to be locked up. If they're not locked up, that would be insane i i'm sure that they are uh he heck if you if you got shares this morning you're locked up for a month right so i'm sure all, all those insiders i'm sure they're locked up um but regardless it's a huge payday right for all because there are guys that got investors that got this stock uh this company uh at evaluation of you know way less than than what they're at right what, what, is, what is this they ipo'd at at 30 million 30 not million 30 billion excuse me 30 billion 35 billion in that range uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a huge payday for all those guys. Wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, we've had a number of big IPOs this year, Spencer, between Coinbase, uh, Robin hood, obviously what, what are some uh, Roblox? I think that was more of a direct listing Airbnb. We will we'll have to do a recap show of all the biggest IPOs of the year. Yeah. Um, I wish we could have gotten Matt Hammond on today, but I th he's I think still on vacation. Um, man, he missed like the, the biggest, uh, biggest IPO. Uh, for a while here, Christian Gallagher says you can't short, shorten the stock till Tuesday, so that's that's important to note. Um, uh, yeah, I just this is like just the most interesting IPO. Uh, let, let's take a look at the volume here. So, the on the opening one minute candle, almost 12 million shares traded in the opening minute. That's pretty, that's that's a nice chunk of, chunk of shares right there. Um, I want, I want to know how this stock kind of reacts like after a couple of days on the market, see how it trades. You know, is, is that volume going to last or is that just big for today before I hop in this for a couple of trades? The volume is going to be huge. I, I, I think for the for going forward, the volume, it, it it's very rare for a, a stock to maintain its volume on its IPO day. I'm not saying that Robin will do that. It probably won't. Basically, no stock does that. Um, but it wouldn't shock me for a second if volume r remains elevated, like on a daily basis, you know, we're talking, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million shares more uh, trading uh, on any given day. Wouldn't shock me for a second. This is going to be, um, this is going to be a talked about stock across the board, across the board on every forum, discord, subreddit, whatever. Yeah. Ruel in the chat, shout out Ruel, watch Ruel's report every Monday night. If you've not, if you have not checked it out already, we're going through the top cryptos, NFTs and related topics. Um, but Ruel saying, what if all the Reddit guys decided to short Robin hood? So that would be an interesting conundrum because then they would be wanting the stock to go down. But at the same time, this is the same crowd that that's looking for the next short squeeze. So maybe we'll, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, You're right. a little catch 22 that we could get caught in there. But I mean, look, I, I want to see kind of what sort of short interest this stock gets once it's been on the on the exchange for a few days, a few weeks, maybe. And yeah, I, I could imagine a lot of people are short Robin Hood. But at the end of the day, I think Robin Hood still has like no, I, I, no, one, I, no one is short Robin Hood right now. Not, not not yet. But I'm saying I think they will be. But I want to know numbers wise. Yeah. How like ha have they been able to retain 
the usership from a year ago today? Or is it just dropping off a yes. cliff? Yes, they have been. I can answer that for you. They have been. I'll show, okay. I'll show, I'll show you some charts that I tweeted out from the, uh, the roadshow on Sunday. They last, the first quarter of 2021 was the best quarter in their history. Okay. The first quarter of 2021 was better than like all of last year. So yes. Um, they, but a lot of that was powered by, you know, the rise of Dogecoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum. And then obviously the past month or so we've seen crypto trading volume dry up some, some increase in crypto trading the past week or so. So I think a lot of their business is actually dependent on that crypto trade, kind of like a coin base. Yes, that's certainly something to look at is uh, crypto trading volume has fallen off a cliff this summer. Uh, you can look, I, there's uh, stats that I've seen looking at May uh, compared to June and July and just volume on all the, it's not any one exchange, right? It's Coinbase, it's Voyager, it's all it Kraken, all the big exchanges. Crypto trading volume is down across the board this summer. Uh, this is also a crypto play, right? Robinhood is a crypto play. So uh, very curious to see that correlation because volume has has fallen off a cliff here this summer. Yep, and Chris Kajay in the chat is giving us some numbers. In the first quarter of 2021, 17% of total revenue came from cryptocurrency compared to just 4% in the fourth quarter of 2020. So in, sure, in take, the take a look, and that's this is what Chris is saying, but just in visual form, right? You can just see that the yellow is crypto. Obviously in 21 there. So that's oh, more than five times it's... Okay, that was for the total of 2020. So it's more than five times the the allocation to the crypto revenue in the first quarter of 2021 compared to the year prior. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's going to be huge for for Robinhood going forward. Like, are we going to see another big Dogecoin surge that's going to going to put a lot of people trading on there, or Bitcoin and Ethereum? Are they going to keep rising? So, I, I I could see this Spencer after a couple of weeks kind of trading with Coinbase. I I could see well. The, you mean down then? <laughs> because Coinbase yeah. is basically going straight down. Uh, I can see that too. I, I think a lot of people think it's just very karmic that you can go on Robinhood and bet against the company. Um, I think I think there's like some. Well, I don't think you can yet. I, I don't well, know. I, I didn't say right now, but like, in you will be able to do that. Although it's probably going to be a hard borrow because it seems like everybody and, and their mother wants to short this thing. But um, you will be able to go on Robinhood and then bet against the company. And there's, I mean, you can do that right now on, on Schwab or Interactive Brokers, right? Um, but there's something karmic to that, uh, I think. So, um, and you can do it, yeah, yeah. So checking back in on AMD, how we started the show. When we started the show, it was about uh, one hundred three fifty, gone up another fifty cents, and then up six percent, up more than six percent right now, Spencer. I mean, I, we talked about it earlier, but once it hit that hundred dollar level, yeah. that was a that was a big deal for AMD. It was. It, it seemed like it. It took forever to get there. Uh, felt like it was going to hit 100, like for the last year, right? That's what it felt like. But it took a while to get there. You know what's holding up okay today? Is Cook. Cook. The Trigger Grills. Trigger Grills is holding up. Right. IPO at 18. We're at 23. I might need to do a deep dive with Luke into the the financials of Traeger because it could be an interesting play, but. Spencer, there are so many companies out there right now doing kind of disruptive things. Like, I just don't know if I want to allocate some of my portfolio to a grill company. It's not a grill. It's just, I thought it was a smoker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's a Traeger. It's a Traeger. Right. That's my mistake. It's a Traeger. Um, all right. <laughs> uh, it's 12.57. You know what? Let me look at coin real fast. How is Coinbase doing today? I'm just out of curiosity. I mean, crypto has been hot the last week, right? We're, we're back in the crypto markets. Yes, I guess. Uh, whoops. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's in the red by one and a half percent, but, uh, go, go, can you go to the daily real quick? When was the last time when, when did, uh, Coinbase was below 200 briefly, correct? Or did it not get all the way down? No, no, no. it never got there. I thought it got to like 190 something at some no, point. Nope. Never I'm, I'm mistaken. Never got there. What was that? What was that opening price? Uh, what was that high? Four twenty nine. The opening was three eighty one. Sheesh. All right. Uh, it's twelve fifty eight. AB. Let me hop off and let me get Neil Hamilton started on get technical, and I'll let you wrap it up here. This was a fun show. We don't need Jason and Luke. Screw those guys. No, who needs them? We we had a packed show between uh, Traeger Grill CEO, obviously on the day of their IPO. We also had Peak FinTech CEO. 
interesting companies. We had a, a special appearance from Young Investor. And not to forget about Frank Curzio, who is sponsoring this episode. So huge shout out to Frank. Um, I'll let you go, Spencer. Get set up with Neil. And, and, and you know what's interesting real fast is there was a very um, – uh, there was a, vol a volume bar increase, a notable volume increase in SoFi when, uh, when, when Robinhood opened up. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Par Paris traders? Look, 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 look at the notice. This is on a one minute. Okay. Look at the volume increase right there. That was, that was the Robinhood open. They were like, oh, well, now that one brokerage is, is listed. We want the other one. <laughs> we, we want to trade them together. It's, it's interesting. And you know what? That was also the low of the day. Interesting interesting trend there. Okay, I'm going to hop. Uh, Neil, Neil's going to start now, and you're, you're going to wrap this up. See you guys. Yep. See you guys later. All right, y'all. Well, coming up after this, we have Get Technical with Neil. We're going to do a quick little 30-minute episode today, so not the full hour. But stick around because we'll be going through the technicals of the new Robinhood IPO. Um, you know, not a lot of technicals yet because the, the stock is just opening, but we will still be able to, to get some clarity on it. We'll also be checking in on some of our other favorite stocks on the show. If you have tickers for us, as always, drop them in the chat once we get over there and we will check them out. Um, and then after that, we have our, our Benzinga crypto show. After that, Benzinga biotech buzz. So we have just a packed show today or packed schedule of shows today, as always, Hey, I'll see y'all over there on the Get Technical stream. Don't go anywhere.